Thank you for your patience. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Zonta Club of Santa Clarita Valley's Life Forward Workshop, Challenging Emotions, Building Resilience in Traumatic Times with presenter Michelle Witkin. Thank you for joining us for this workshop this morning. I'm Nicole Miller, president of the Zonta Club of Santa Clarita Valley. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the chat. You can send any questions that will be read out anonymously during the presentation to the submit questions here in the chat. And to make all of our guests comfortable today while we record this workshop, we have privacy settings. So feel free to click on stop video to disable your camera. And this presentation will be recorded live on Facebook and will be uploaded and available to view also on our website. Please feel free to share this with friends and family. We are requesting that everyone remain muted. It will only record the host. Please feel free to share this presentation with your fam friends and family and visit our past workshops on our website at scvzonta.org. And now I present Phyllis Walker, Chair of our Life Forward Committee. Phyllis? So well Welcome everyone to Zonta's Life Forward Workshop, Challenging Emotions, Building Resilience in Traumatic Times. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michelle Whitkin. Michelle has earned her PhD and is a licensed psychologist in private practice here in Valencia with more than 25 years experience. She specializes in treating children teens and adults with obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety disorders. She has been a featured speaker on podcasts and radio shows, including the OCD stories, Moms Without Worry, and Tell Me What You're Proud Of. She is a regular presenter at national conferences and writes on topics related to anxiety and OCD. Dr. Whitkin is a graduate of the International OCD Foundation's Behavior Therapy Training Institute and Pediatric, uh, and is a clinical fellow of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. She is also trained in supportive parenting for anxious childhood emotions. And now, Michelle, the stage is yours to share your experience and help us learn how we can work with our emotions during these turbulent times. Good morning. Thank you guys for having me here. Um, <laughs> I see several, I, I feel like I got some of my, some of my people are here. So a shout out to, to my mom and my, my beautiful sister-in-law and friend, Bonnie, and my lovely friend, Doreen, and hello to all of you. Um, so, you know, it's like always the hardest to do a presentation when people that you love um, are on it because you have to go home and face them afterward, but, but um, at, at any rate, so um, I'm going to try to hold myself together. So one thing I, I want to do is I want to invite you guys all to feel free um, to put questions into the chat as I'm going, if there's um, anything that you want to share, I'm actually going to probably ask some questions at the beginning. Well, I'm not probably, I'm actually going to ask questions at the beginning. Um, and, and hopefully as we go through, so feel free to put your answers into the chat. Um, and again, please, you know, anytime ask questions. And I'm also going to try to leave some time at the end for questions. Um, last year when I was here, I did a presentation on um, coping with depression and anxiety and loneliness. And this year I'm doing something kind of different. Um, so I, I hope that it will meet people's needs. But if it's not, you know, feel free to say, hey, you're not talking about this. Can you talk to me about this? And I'd be like so happy to do that. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen and I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you. I'll probably go in and out of it today. So here we go. Okay. So there's the title and let's get going. Okay. This does not want to change. There it goes. Okay. So here we are. It's, uh, what's the date anymore? Does anybody remember the date, right? Okay, it's September, almost end of September of 2021. Do you guys 
remember the beginning of all of this, March 2020, and maybe as we watched it even before March of 2020. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you guys would kind of put in the chat like what you thought that you were in for. What did you think that the whole pandemic was going to be like? Send me a couple of notes. I want to see what you guys think. I feel like I should play like the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we've got Doreen said that she expected uncertainty and Jeanette has said um, that it would be a terrible flu season, not a lockdown. Bonnie says there's no way that this is gonna reach us all the way from China, right? Yeah, I thought that. Um, and it's, you know, it was scary not knowing what's going to happen. Um, so I, I have a question. I've been using first names. Is that okay? Or is it better if I stop doing that? Need feedback from my, um, okay. Um, so, all right, coming back to what we're talking about. Okay. Um, then we've got, uh, Sarah, I expected people to take it seriously and a lot of people still don't. So um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I think a lot of us, um, we didn't really know for sure what to expect and it may have fulfilled our expectations and it may not have. Um, so let me pull my screen back up again. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, oops, let me go back for a second. Okay. So what, what a lot of us thought way back a year plus ago, year and a half or more ago was, you know, I'm going to kind of hang out on the couch for a little while, or I'm going to learn to cook some more, or I'm going to do a lot of more self-care. I'm gonna learn a language, right? A lot of us had that kind of thing going on. Um, I don't th I think most of us didn't think it was gonna last so long. And for sure, um, there was the uncertainty and, and it's kind of hung over a lot of us. And as time passed, we really recognized even more the uncertainty of this whole thing, right? We still don't know when this is going to end or when things are gonna go back to looking semi-normal. You know, it's, we've all made a big transition to doing a lot of stuff online and we haven't gone back to doing a number of things that we've done in the past. And then I would say that there's a lot of loneliness. And, and I'm curious, like for you guys, what are some of the things that you're currently experiencing as we're kind of in this for the long haul? Okay, so... Again, this is an opportunity to share share with me where where are you right now? Okay, we've got an increase in anxiety. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What else, guys? I'm tired. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm tired, more tired than ever. Exhaustion, lots of anxiety. I've got a repeat there. Okay. Paranoid. Yeah. Like what's what like and and can can you say more about the paranoid? Because I could tell you what I think it means, but I want to reflect it based on what you um what you're thinking. Trying to remember how to get back to what it used what used to be normal. Um, you, you know, it's interesting trying to remember how to get back, like uh, for a lot of us, um, and this sort of phenomena, like we've become sort of socially unsure, like some of the skills we had, we may not feel like we have them so much anymore, or like we need to practice, or it feels weird going back to some of the things that are semi back, you know, uh, happening again, right? Um, okay, so we've got a lot of uncertainty, a repeat of uncertainty. Um, 
We've got when to feel comfortable to be with people who do not want to get vaccinated. Like, how do I know? How do I know if I should be comfortable with them or not? Right. Um, Bonnie said she's appreciating the vaccine. She's got definite anxiety overload and trying to be careful without becoming overly obsessive. Yeah, it's like there's, you know, with that information changing all the time too, right? We constantly are being told to do different things. Um, okay, about the paranoid, not knowing what's coming, never knowing what exactly is going on and not knowing when or if it will have an end. Yeah, and, and, and I would say that that's really a lot about uncertainty. You know, what, what will it be? And we can start to fear the worst. We can start to go to what if. Any of you guys do that? Go to what if? What if this happens? What if this happens? I've got some nodding there. So we'll, we'll talk about those what ifs. Um, and then we've got, it's scary going out. I still feel anxiety around a lot of people. It's scary to go to the mall. Um, so it, it can feel quite it, 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 you know, confusing, scary, all those things. All right. So I want you guys to know you're not alone in the things that you're sharing. And you probably noticed that other people were sharing things that you were thinking. Okay. Okay. So one of the things I want to talk about, you know, the title of this is about, um, you know, difficult managing your emotions um, in, in traumatic times. So one of the things I was kind of curious about is like, has this time actually been traumatic? So the first thing I did, because I love the dictionary is I went to Merriam Webster dictionary and I went, you know, well, what is the definition of traumatic? And traumatic is psychologically or emotionally stressful in a way that can lead to serious mental and emotional problems or it can be relating to being or caused by a sudden severe, often life-threatening injury to the body. Okay. So has the pandemic, has the last year and a half led, has it been stressful in a way that's led to serious mental and emotional problems? Maybe for some of us it has. Um, and, and for some of us, it has not. So I guess it really depends on the person. And has it caused sudden severe life-threatening injury to the body? Well, maybe to some people it has, right? So the answer is not, it's, it's not like yes or no for sure. It really depends on the person. But for many of us, it's not necessarily traumatic. But what it is, I'm working so many controls at once, you guys. Popping up the chat and I'm doing different things with my screen, so I'm sorry if I'm a little slow in moving things sometimes here. So it, at the very least, what we can say is that this pandemic has been an ongoing stressor for the majority of people and a source of uncertainty. And I think we're hearing that from all of you. Okay, so Let's kind of talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so I wanna share some research with you about what we know so far. Okay, so th this, what I'm sharing with you is a report from March of 2021. It's called St um, Statistics from, uh, sorry, Stress in America, One Year Later, A New Wave of Pandemic Health Concerns. And so, was somebody gonna say something? Okay, I think I just heard some background noise. Um, okay, so what this was a survey, and I can't remember the number of adults that they surveyed, but in the United States, a majority of adults surveyed, 61% of adults, have experienced an undesirable weight change during this last year plus. Okay, that doesn't just mean an increase, it could mean an undesirable decrease in weight. All right, and in um, in parentheses over there, what you see is that people actually in, in experienced a greater um, undesired change in their weight the more that they rated their stress being higher during this time. So if you feel more stressed out, you're more likely to have experienced a greater undesirable change in your weight up or down. 
Um, we also know that 60, I'm sorry, 67% of adults are sleeping more or less than they want to be sleeping. Um, so I know like for myself, one of the things that I said is I'm tired and I saw exhaustion come up, right? But how many of you find that your sleep patterns are not what they were before all of this? You know, and why is that? <laughs> Got a comment, what is sleep? <laughs> um, yeah, do you remember sleep? Yeah, so I'm definitely sleeping less. Insomnia has, choice insomnia has gotten worse. Okay. Um, we've got sleepless nights coming up here too. Okay. Um, I, I think um, for me, one thing that's kind of interrupted my sleep is like my routine has been changed up. Um, and I think also because I'm not moving as much as I did in the past. I mean, even when I was going, I don't go to my office anymore. I see patients all by telehealth right now. And I used to at least get up and walk to the bathroom in between every single person I saw. And I had a step counter and that was like 200 steps going back and forth just to the bathroom. Like, you know, so, and I go to the bathroom a lot. I don't know about, about the rest of you, but I go to the bathroom a lot. So I'm not doing that anymore. Like still go to the bathroom, but not as far. Um, to see, no, everything's still working fine, I think. But anyway, um, so so not moving as much. Um, and, and I don't think that I've made up for that. You know, so you guys may have noticed that there are things that have changed for you that are that are impacting your sleep, or maybe not. So another thing that we know is um, when essential workers were surveyed, 29% of them said that their mental health has worsened during the pandemic. You know, and if you think about essential workers, this makes a lot of sense. These are the people who had to be working in person throughout this whole pandemic. So that could be healthcare workers, that could be custodians, that could be your food service workers, um, so many different professions, right? Um, so a lot more stress on those, on those folks. Um, also, people of color, um, so 54% of Blacks and 48% of Hispanics are reporting since the beginning of the pandemic that they have concerns about the future. So this, this, this group, um, which is a really varied group, has a lot of concerns about what are things going to be like. I expect them to be worse in the future. And this was something we were talking about at the beginning, this last point, um, actually I was talking with um, uh, some of the folks from, from Zonta before we started the presentation that young adults are the group that their mental health has been impacted the most. So 46% um, of young adults report that their mental health has gotten worse during this period of time. And we can extend that also to you know, older teens as well. And if you think about it, it's such a time of change and transition. Those years when you're finishing high school, getting ready to transition out into the world, a lot of independence is happening and, and many rituals, ceremonies, um, rite of passage things have been canceled for these people. And, and this group has really seen a lot of their job prospects feel like they've changed too. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here for a second and I wanna see if anybody has any questions that you have before I continue on. Or if I missed anything so far, you would have wanted to know just about how we're doing. So I don't see anything coming up in the chat right now, but if it does, um, I'll make sure to answer it. And um, maybe Nicole, if you see anything pop up, will you let me know? I will, and I don't see any questions so far. Perfect, okay. So let's talk about how we thrive in the face of, we still have ongoing stress and we have uncertainty right now. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is like the ways that we cope that actually are not very healthy for us. Some of the stuff that we tend to do, and I'm going to tell you, I do some of these things myself. Okay. So just being a psychologist, 
who's supposed to know doesn't make you immune from doing things the wrong way and constantly having to kind of take, um, take stock of what it is I'm doing, how well am I doing, and what do I need to kind of fix? All right, so, so some of what we do when we're stressed and we're unsure is we overeat or we undereat. Definitely me. Any of you guys do that during this period, overeat, undereat? Yeah, I got some hands raised. Yeah, it, it was, it's been my, uh, <laughs> it's been my, um, my joy, my eating during this time. And, and uh, one of the things I've been doing during the pandemic is experimenting more with cooking and recipes. So yeah, that's been contributing to that. Um, we tend to have poor sleep habits. Okay, so why? Um, I don't have to get up as early in the morning. So maybe I don't go to bed. Maybe I stay up on my devices later. Maybe I watch that show later. Maybe I'm losing track of time. Um, a, lot, a lot of times what we will do is we will increase our alcohol or drug consumption when we're dealing with stress. This is very common. We see this after actually disasters. So um, after let's say like the 1994 earthquake out here in the LA area, consumption of alcohol and drugs goes up. Um, after people experience a traumatic event, after a hurricane, after a fire, people will increase. It's sort of, our nerves are frazzled and it feels kind of like um, this will settle us down a little bit or maybe help us forget. Um, and, and I don't know, this is just sort of my own hypothesis, but I think like, what else did we have to do that was fun during this shutdown, <laughs> right? So let's, let's party a little bit more. Some of this, so this is just sort of anecdotal, but some of the psychologists that I um, am connected with noticed that people were showing up to their online groups because their groups went from in-person to online and they started showing up with like wine or a drink or high um, during the groups. And it's something that people wouldn't have done in person. So, um, but we've noticed it happening during the pandemic and we've kind of had to talk to people about like, would you do it if you're coming in person? So at any rate, it backfires on us though, because um, it, you know, we can certainly gain weight. We're not gonna function as well. Um, and any symptoms that we may, we may be experiencing from the stress, et cetera, um, we're going to only feel them more when the impact of the alcohol or whatever substance we've used wears off. Um, plus, if there was any damage done by what we were using at that time. Okay, another thing we might do is we lash out at others more. How many of you have been completely patient with the people that you love during this time? You've been totally patient. Excellent. I have not. <laughs> Anybody else struggle with a little bit of irritability or getting angry? I can see some nodding going on. Um, yeah, it, it's just uncertain times, stressful times, we may lash out at others. And, and what happens? Well, not only are we stressed out, but now we have to deal with um, making it up and repairing when we um, get into it with people we love. And Jeanette says, yeah, very low patience. But yeah, our patience is much more thin right now for many, many people, not for everybody, but for many people. So those of you who are doing well with the patients, big kudos to you. That really takes a tremendous amount of strength to do that. Carmen says she has no patience. Yeah, and that I, I think patience is a skill that we have to um, practice and craft and keep working on. So I always say like all, anything that's healthy for us is usually a work in progress. Um, although there are some things that come very naturally to some of us. But. Okay, another thing we tend to do is we withdraw from other people. So how many of you noticed that you have withdrawn from other people during this time? Yeah, I'm gonna see some hands, okay. In, in part, um, being going under lockdown and shutdown basically 
required that we not be seeing people as much as we were. Um, but for some of us, because the, the sense of things not being the same, we may be feeling more depressed and we may pull away. Okay. And what's really interesting is when we pull away, what that actually creates is it creates more loneliness, more sadness. Um, and it, it just sort of rebounds on itself and continues to create a cycle of sense of isolation. Um, what another thing that we tend to do is just endless hours of TV or other things that are kind of mindless. Um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, young people I know watching a lot of YouTube. Um, and then, you know, a lot of time um, watching shows, playing games that they're not necessarily really engaged with. Doreen says she misses spending time with family, friends, and gathering. Yeah, it's, and, and we'll definitely talk about that. Okay, another thing that we tend to do during times of stress and uncertainty, we worry. And what I mean by worrying is I mean, we start thinking a lot about things that are out of our control. We start thinking about the what ifs. Okay? And the what ifs aren't like, what if this all ends tomorrow and it's great and I get to see everybody again? Or what if um, somebody finds a cure and we never have to worry about this again? Um, we, they, a colleague of mine likes to say that the what if is usually followed by a catastrophe clause, right? So what if this never ends? What if I don't get to ever go to that wedding? What if I never go back to normal? What you know, so, and then we will spend time in our heads going over and over and over it and trying to solve it. The problem is it's not solvable, so we get stuck. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk with you guys now about things that we can do that can, that can help us and that can build resilience for us. Before I do that, I'm gonna ask any, any questions, anything that you guys wanna hear about that I haven't addressed so far. Okay. Again, if I see any, I will, I will stop and answer that. Okay. So one thing that's important, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we improve our nutrition. And being a psychologist, I'm not gonna spend a tremendous amount of time here and tell you what it is to eat well. You know, you guys probably have resources for that. Um, but what, we, what I am gonna tell you is that if we're feeding ourselves good, healthy food, then we have the energy to do the repair that we knew the, that, that we need to do. We have the energy um, to participate in activities, to think through things and to be more emotionally healthy. Because what if we feed ourselves is going to help our mental health and our well being and how we're coping with stress. Additionally, same thing if we're limiting our alcohol and drug intake. Okay, this one, making time to move. So I mentioned that I have struggled to move as much during this. How many of you guys have struggled to move during the pandemic? Find you're moving less. Yeah, okay. How many of you guys lost some of the ways that you um, had your fitness? I went to a small gym in the past and that doesn't even exist anymore. It's even out of business. Um, and how many of you just feel like you just don't have the energy to move? Got some hands being raised there. Okay. It feels, it feels tough, right? It's, it's hard. So the, here's the thing that we know about, about exercise and well-being. Um, many, many, many research studies show that if we can get some exercise, that it's actually going to help improve our mood, we're going to feel less stressed out, and we're going to have overall better well-being. We're also going to sleep better if we're moving. Um, so something that's important is to find things that you actually enjoy in terms of moving. 
I actually got my son out the other day because I was like, okay, we got to stop sitting around. And um, he and I went rock climbing, um, which I have never done before. And it was terrifying and I didn't get very high, but I still got a very excellent workout <laughs> um, and it was fun. Okay. So, so when, in terms of moving, it's important to think about like, what do I enjoy? Do I like to take a walk? Do I like to hike? You know, do, do I like to just get on the swing at a park? Um, is there kind of dancing I like? Can I dance at home on my own? So, you know, it's about getting creative and it doesn't have to be big giant things. It can be when I get up in the morning before I have breakfast, I'm going to walk a certain number of steps and then doing that. Um, so, and then it can be small goals throughout the day. It doesn't need to be big things. Got some comments here. I'm just going to take a quick peek. Um, yeah, we've got, we gave up our gym membership and now we've not done much. Yeah, I kind of disrupted the routine and it's like trying to find something else, huh? It, it's, it's, and maybe that's something where you can pull family together um, or whoever you might've worked out with in the past and talk about what could you do that's different. Um, Bonnie says, just went back to the gym. Um, before this meeting, it was tough to get, to get there, but I'm forcing my motivation. I must. Yeah. It, it's, it's good for you for taking care of your well being. It's, it's really, it's hard to take those first steps. Um, oh, Sarah, this is excellent. I went from doing nothing to going out and coaching. She, she's coaching her daughter in soccer now. That's really, really great. You've got to move around with those kids now. And um, that's a great way to move, right? You sort of get that vicarious, well, it's not even vicarious. They're running around and you have to run around after them. So great way to exercise. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Something else that's important is finding ways to connect. Okay, since many of us are feeling sense of connection. So what can we do when we've got this limited ability to connect um, and still find ways to be able to be around other people in some way that's meaningful? Okay, so if you live with people, if there are people that you are able to spend time with in person, you might wanna take a little bit of stock of, do I have the TV on all the time? Um, or, you know, are, are my family members on their devices and are we not connecting? Because it can be pretty easy to get caught up and that's the routine. So some families have found like, okay, let's turn the devices off for a little bit so we can at least connect with each other. Maybe it's even like we turn our devices off during a meal together. Um, but having that lack of distraction can help people who are together interact a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna, um, actually, I'm just gonna go to the next one. Okay, so this next one is um, where I'm talking about limiting exposure to media and video of harassment and, and assault. Um, one of the things, what I'm, what I'm actually talking about here is it's very easy when we're sitting at home to get caught up in watching videos that are posted online or things that are shown on TV, showing a lot of hateful act, um, uh, violent acts, things that make us fear that everything's going wrong or that we're gonna be a target, okay? And it's important that we not overdo our um, exposure to that. So I wrote here, I don't want that to be confused with avoiding. I'm not saying that we should stay away and pretend like we can't handle that and not watch it or know what's going on. But what I'm talking about is that phenomenon where we will get hooked and we'll watch it over and over. And it might, maybe the TV is on all day long where we're scrolling through social media, watching and seeing different ways that videos that people are posting or memes or articles on and on and on and on. And what that can do is it can take us out of connecting with what's going on here in the real world. And it can make us feel isolated and like things are hopeless and that we have no future. Okay, so important to cut it down and try to interact with the people around us or, you know, get on a call with a friend or go sit distance from somebody in a park 
or go watch people doing something out in the world, right? That reminds us of um, that there's goodness still out there and that people actually generally still really care for each other. You know, that can help us feel much more connected and less like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be awful. Um, if there are young adults in your life, really recognizing that they have lost a lot of their ability to celebrate milestones and traditions and thinking like, what can we do that could be a way to do it even in the context of a pandemic? I actually wanna ask you guys if you've come up with any interesting ways to celebrate things during this time. You know, I know in the beginning we were seeing some of those little like drive-by celebrations, um, you know, where people would like hand gifts out the car window or things like that. I think that, I think we've um, had a lot more creative things come up since then. So anybody have any ideas that you wanna share? All right, guys. Oh, got something in the chat here, let's see. Ah, yard signs for graduates. Yeah, we didn't see those so much. I know somebody who started a whole yard sign business during the pandemic and they're doing a lot of those. Anything else people have done and found meaningful and useful to connect and celebrate? You know, somebody who, um, yeah, did somebody say something? No, okay. Um, I, I've certainly seen people have like Zoom celebrations or Zoom game nights. Um, I have seen people do socially distant um, uh, events where people are maybe like far apart doing things or doing things more outdoors um, to celebrate. So um, we've got my son graduated last year and he and gave, and it's, oh, the school gave out signs. Yeah, so a way to kind of mark it because they're different than maybe walking across the stage but getting a sign, exactly. Um, making videos, combining clips from family and friends with congratulations or birthday wishes. Yeah, exactly, that's another great way. Um, I was gonna say, um, I, I noticed that there's actually a group out in uh, Santa Clarita, it's on Facebook, and I'm sure there are many others like it where they've adopted um, graduating seniors in the Santa Clarita Valley. And so like I've um, adopted a teen last year and another one this year who was graduating from high school and showered on them some gifts, you know, like their favorite treats or gift cards to things that they wanted. Um, because they were missing out on some of those other transitional things that they would have done. So, so it's, you know, there's a lot of creativity here and you can kind of, you know, get your heads together with people you care about and, and do some things um, to mark it, to mark the, um, the special ceremony, the, the special milestones. Um, another thing that's important um, is participating in activities that are culturally affirming, right? So whatever culture you are connected with, it's important that you find some way to participate in those right now. The usual ones may not be here, okay? So can anybody think about culturally affirming activities, what those might be? Like, what do I mean even? So, um, I have a group that's um, involved in celebrating the different holidays going on based on my faith, I'm Jewish. And um, there's a group of us that connect over foods for different holidays and we share all of our recipes and we've been able to do it at a distance. Um, and it's felt very positive because oh, my celebrations are smaller than normal if they're happening at all. Anybody find that there are other things that you guys have done? If you think of them, Sharon, in the chat, okay? Um, and then just finding, cre creating meaningful ways to connect it all. Um, one of my friends actually does, um, they, she does book club far apart from people in person. Some people are doing book club online. Any other meaningful ways people have found to connect? Please feel free to share them, okay? Love to see them. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about self-care. Um, I'm gonna stop the share for a minute to talk to you guys. How many of you kind of like laugh when you hear about self-care? Self-care, huh? <laughs> I can see some hands going up. Okay. When, when we hear self-care, um, we've got a hand raised there. I'm watching your guys' comments as I'm talking. When, when we talk about self-care, how many of you guys think that self-care is something big and we haven't, um, and, and that we can't do these big things or we just, there's no ability to do those big things. Do any of you guys think that self-care is about it's big stuff? Can it be small stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You haven't had the chance to have your hair done since the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a lot of us. My pharmacist has taken to wearing a, uh, a bandana, which I think looks really lovely on her, but I believe that it's covering up the, the lack of having the hair done is what she's told me. Um, so, okay, why self-care? <laughs> why is it important? We've got a comment here. I wouldn't say that it's big. It just feels like a million different small things that can't be tackled on my own. Yeah, okay. So, why do you guys think self-care is important? Any thoughts about that? Like even if it was just a few minutes a day. You, know, you guys are like, yeah, re-energize. Doreen says we wanna re-energize. And Shanae says self-care is mental health, right? When we take care of ourselves, and it doesn't have to be big things, when we take care of ourselves, even in little ways, it actually starts to re-energize us, right? Ah, and Sarah says, if we don't, this is what the point I was just about to say, Sarah, if we don't take care of us, no one else will, right? So what happens if you're not taking care of you, right? You keep pouring and pouring and pouring, and pretty soon that cup is empty. And if your cup is empty, then how do you give to other people? And I think, I think my guess is that most of you are very, very good at giving to other people, right? That there are so many people you care about in your life and you probably a lot of times put them first. I know I tend to do that, right? A lot of times it's my kids and my husband that come first. Uh, we've got, um, we need to fill our own tanks our own love tanks yes yeah we do have to fill our own love tanks right we cannot give to others if we are on empty so it can even be just little teeny teeny tiny things but it does kind of re-energize us okay so when i used to think when people told me to self-care that they were they meant i needed to go get a massage or that i needed to go take a long bath with candles which by the way is on a list that i'm going to give you today but it, the list I'm going to give you has a lot of other things. Okay. Even just a few minutes of stepping aside to do something that's just for you can be incredibly re-energizing, right? So I'm going to show you just a real quick um, glance at, oops, I forgot to share it. Hang on, guys. I'm going to give you a real quick glance at something I have here. Okay, and this is a document I'm giving to all of you. I did not make this document. This is something I'm going to tell you. My own therapist gave me this one. Um, and, and the thing I love about it is it breaks self-care down. It's actually called 60 Ways to Nurture Myself. And it breaks it down into the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual because there's so many different ways to care for ourselves. So, and, and I like them because... Some of them are these big long ones, like I said, soak in a hot bath with candles and music and you know, get a massage. But this one, a physical one, sit in the sun for 15 minutes. Did you know that could be re-energizing or watching birds and animals interacting? Right? For some people, like you can take a look at this, you can add your own, right? But, but for many of us, that can be nurturing and re-energizing. Pet your cat or your dog or pet somebody else's cat or dog if they'll let you, right? Write a poem, write an email to somebody. Meditate, by the way, meditation can be just a minute long. Um, 
praying. This is the, some of the spiritual ones. Okay. So lots of different options here. I'm going to give this to you, but just a you know just a reminder that it's important for us to take care of ourselves. And I'm seeing that there are some comments. Oh, can I post a link for the chart? So um, you're actually all going to get a copy of this as a handout after today. So it'll it'll come to you. You can have it to keep. So you don't have to worry about copying any of that down. Um, ah, Shanae, good. This is this is Shanae's self care for the day, right? So attending something that is interesting to you can absolutely be self care. Okay. Um, one of the things that I do is I listen to podcasts in the car when I'm driving, or I listen to books um, when I'm driving. And that is self-care for me. For someone else, that would be a chore. So, you, you know, when you see something, it may be self-care for you. It may be self-care for someone else, but choose what fits for you. All right, guys. Going back. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay. Can everybody see my screen still? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about sleep. Um, we know sleep is important. Why is it important? Well, if we don't get enough sleep, it can lead to physical and mental health problems. It can actually lead to an increased risk of death, believe it or not. Helps our brain work properly. It plays a really important role in our physical health. Like when we are sleeping, our body actually does physical repair. Um, that sleep helps to keep our organs functioning properly. It helps our brain to consolidate information, right? It, it helps us function safely too. If we're not sleeping properly, our reaction time can be off. So we're driving the car and maybe we don't hit that brake as quickly. Right? Or if we're working with heavy machinery, right? So, um, or maybe we're just not paying attention to what's around us as much. So these are the reasons that we wanna make sure we're getting sleep. And you guys probably all knew that. Um, but if you didn't, I'm glad to share it. I'm happy to be sharing it. But let's talk about some healthy sleep habits, all right? One of the things that's most important in terms of healthy sleep is going to bed and waking up at roughly the same time every day. But I don't know if any of you have ever tried to do this and you're trying to go to bed, but you can't go to sleep. You're like, I'm trying to have this as my sleeping time, but I don't fall asleep. Well, it's not so much the, the, the going to sleep time that's key. What's actually really key is starting by setting a wake up time. Right, because we're, we're not going to be able to force ourselves to sleep if we're not sleepy. But if you start to make yourself get up at about the same time every single day, your body will start to get sleepy at about the same time every single day. So this going to sleep time or sorry, the waking up time is where it's really kind of crucial. Um, now, what a lot of the people I work with kind of balk at is when I talk with them about this. Yes, it means the weekends, too. Right. Some people are like, I want to sleep late on the weekends. Well, sleeping really late on the weekends can actually mess with your sleep so much that it will dysregulate everything. So it's important to keep it roughly the same time if you're trying to really impact your sleep. We also, this is another one people balk at a lot with me. We have to, it's really important to turn our devices off about an hour before we're going to sleep. Because what happens is, those devices, the light from them and the stimulation from them don't allow our brain to release the natural melatonin it releases um, to help us go to sleep at night. And it also um, signals to us that it's not just not time to sleep. So um, if you stay on those devices all the way until you may have more trouble falling asleep or getting quality sleep, you know, um, there are, you know, if you absolutely have to be on your devices, there are some blue light blockers 
that you, you know, or some of them have nighttime mode, like phones may have nighttime mode that you can use. It's not ideal, but it's certainly better than being on it with the regular light. Um, being physically active during the day can help us. Um, I mentioned that earlier, it actually helps make us sleepier, helps us have more quality sleep. The basics of avoiding caffeine, nicotine, large meals, and not exercising right before bed. If we exercise right before bed, now we're kind of amped up. Um, keeping our room dark, keeping it cool, if we can, actually helps us sleep better. And if you have a relaxing routine before bed, you're going to sleep better too. So that's the where I mentioned um, uh, self-care. It could be a really good time to do some of your quiet self-care right before bed because it can be the thing that helps you to fall asleep. Some people like to do a little bit of meditation before bed or fold laundry before bed. Interestingly, folding laundry for some people can be really calming. I, I don't recommend it if you absolutely hate it, but I know some people find it incredibly calming and it helps them go to sleep. Okay, so a caveat though about sleep, all right? So do some of you find yourselves tossing and turning and worrying that you're not gonna get sleep? Just notice there's some questions. Okay, so, okay. I'm just looking back through your questions right now. Um, Okay, so if you're finding yourself tossing and turning and worrying that you can't get sleep, a lot of times that's exactly what's interfering with your sleep. So I have people who come in to see me and they're like, I can't sleep and it's gonna ruin my school or I'm not gonna be awake for work or I'm not gonna be able to be in tip top shape for the things that I wanna do the next day. If we lie in bed, and we know that it's important to sleep and we're like, I need to sleep, I need to sleep, I need to sleep, we're actually working against ourselves. Right. Think about this, if you're, if you're constantly telling yourself and worrying that you're not gonna sleep, what do you think happens? Anybody have any ideas? Jeanette has trouble turning her brain off. And Doreen agrees. I've got a comment here. You're not going to go to sleep. You're exactly right, Shanae. If you're sitting there and you're worrying, what it happens is it turns on your fight or flight response. Okay. So fight or flight now, and we'll talk about anxiety and fight or flight in a minute, but our fight or flight is the thing that says we're in danger and it now has amped us up. So if you're lying in bed, worrying that you're not going to sleep, you're not going to sleep. And it, it's going to be really hard. So one of the best things that we can do is kind of go into this place where it's okay if I don't fall asleep. And it's really important that we accept that for ourselves. I might not fall asleep. And if we can do that, generally what happens is our body calms down. Okay. And I even say to people, if you're laying in there and you've been in bed for more than like 20, 30 minutes and you're still worrying and you can't sleep, get out, do that quiet thing. Actually, this is when folding laundry can be a good activity. I worked with a teen who actually, she must've had a lot of friends who were celebrating, but she would wrap gifts when she couldn't sleep. She'd sit in the like tiny, tiny bit of light and wrap gifts and she would get tired, okay? Um, but then when you actually feel sleepy, that's when you get back into bed. But don't hang in there worrying, um, okay. And I, 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 I hear what you're saying, Bonnie. Bonnie's just letting us know that she wants to catch everything, but she's also got stuff going on. Okay, so I'm gonna just check with you guys, see if you have any other questions before I continue on. Anything from anybody? Okay. All right. Okay, so let's talk about dealing with uncertainty and worry right now. Okay, so a lot of what happens that works against us when we're dealing with uncertainty, like the I don't know what's going to happen, which is what's happening to all of us right now. I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know if that event that I'm supposed to go to is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen with my work. I don't know if they're going to want me in or not. I don't know if I'll get to see my friends. I don't know if the kids are going to school. I don't know if they're gonna to have to come and be back home. 
Um, if we are constantly, um, you know, being bombarded with a lot of that uncertainty, our fight or flight can get raised and we can start to feel um, like we can't cope. And a lot of what we can do is start to tell ourselves, I, I can't cope without knowing, I just can't. And we'll kind of torture ourselves. So we may also, as I mentioned before, try to problem solve something that's unsolvable. We don't know the future. And a lot of us will get stuck up there in our head, going over and over and over, trying to solve it. But we don't get any closer to an answer when we do that. We may try to avoid things altogether. Okay, I'm just not gonna deal with this. I'm gonna pretend none of this is happening. I'm gonna bury myself and I'm gonna just like try to escape all of it. And we also may be telling ourselves, this is terrible if I'm amped up. I can't be uncomfortable. I need to calm down. I need to relax. But did you notice what I was doing when I was saying that? I need to calm down. I need to relax. I looked like I was getting a little bit more amped up, huh? And the more we actually tell ourselves, calm down, relax, relax, this is unhealthy, the more that we actually start to struggle. So let's talk about how we can actually deal with it. So one thing that can be really helpful is if you find yourself jumping ahead into the future and trying to predict what's going to happen, or if your kids are even doing that, or someone you love, come, come back into the, this moment for a second, right? Like right now you can even do that. Like look around you and just notice a couple things that are in the room. Like, what do you see? Like I see the fan above me is turning. And I can actually feel the air that's coming through this room. And so if, you know, what do you see in the room that you're in? What do you feel or what do you hear? Okay. That can interrupt the process of worrying. Okay. If we can interrupt that process, then we can resist problem solving the unsolvable. What we will find is we will waste a lot of time trying to solve stuff that has no solution. Okay, and if you can bring yourself into the moment, go, I am not going to try to solve this. Thank you, brain. By the way, did you guys know that our brains are actually like problem solving machines? They, they are, right? And so when we get a little bit anxious, what our brain, our brain doesn't know she's thinking about something that could possibly happen in the future not something that's not a problem right now. If we're anxious, our brain is like, oh, there's something going on. We need to fix this. And so it jumps automatically into problem solving. Okay, But the thinking part of our brain can actually notice when we're doing that and go, oh, I don't actually have to. Perf An example from my life is a few months ago, I had a... Um, had a misunderstanding with somebody over something. And I got notice about 11 o'clock at night that, that this misunderstanding had occurred, but I couldn't talk with them. So I started thinking, oh no, maybe they're not gonna talk to me again. Oh no, maybe they're not gonna um, you know, interact with my loved one who they were supposed to have an appointment with. Oh no, what if they're gonna charge me and then refuse to talk to me or believe me? I'm spinning. Right. And I'm thinking about all the ways I need to deal with it. And my husband actually looked at me and he went, what would you tell your patients? And I went, oh, yeah, I don't know if any of this is going to happen. Why am I getting up here in my head? And so I had to kind of stop, notice what was around me. And, and I said, I'm, I don't have control over what's going to happen. But right now, there isn't anything happening. And there's not anything I can actually do to problem solve. So I have to let go of what's out of my control. And even though that can feel uncomfortable, it can take us out of that, that never ending loop. We also want to recognize that feeling anxious is normal. A lot of us have gotten the message that anxiety is bad. And anxiety is not bad. Anxiety is just a normal emotion and physiological response that we feel. If we say it's bad and we're trying to get rid of it, just like I mentioned before, what will happen is we'll feed it. 
because again, you go back to our brain, which doesn't know the difference between danger and I'm worrying. If you're worrying because you're anxious, your brain is like, why is she worrying? Why is she anxious? We must need, we must need more adrenaline and it will keep on feeding you adrenaline. You'll keep feeling really uncomfortable. But if you can kind of step back and go, it's okay to be anxious. It's okay to have these feelings and even describe them or even use this, come back to the moment, describe what you see around you and even describe the physical feelings you feel. Pretty soon your brain will get the message that like, oh, okay, we don't actually need to do anything. We can calm down now. Anxiety will always pass, particularly if we don't fight with it. So this is about allowing your feelings to be while you continue to do things that are meaningful, important to you. By the way, a lot of people tell me, well, I can't do things that are important to me if I'm anxious because it'll ruin the time. I mean, yeah, you might be doing something while you feel anxious, but I think it's a question of like, what's more important to you? Is it more important to you to be there for people you love and care about? Or is it more important for you to deal with the anxiety and make the anxiety and the uncomfortable feelings go away. Right? Kind of come back to like, what is important to me? It's okay to be anxious in doing what we care about anyway. And if we do, eventually the anxiety will pass. Any questions at this point, guys? I want to remind you all and, and encourage you to remind yourself that you actually cope with uncertainty all the time, right? But you, but you discount it because you don't realize that you do it. Like right now, I want you to think about somebody that you love that's not in the house with you or in the location you're at, okay? But you're pretty sure you know where they are. And I want you to think about them, all right? So I'm going to ask you, how do you know that they're okay and safe right now? I mean, you take it for granted, right? But the truth is we don't know absolutely positively for sure exactly what's happening with people we love that are out of our sight right now, right? Like I don't, I think that my car right now is in the garage, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know 100% for sure that when my husband opened the garage this morning that somebody didn't take it and drive away, okay? So these are examples about we don't, we cope all the time with things that are unsure. All right, and with the pandemic, we can cope with it too. It's again, like we don't need to know. We can come back to right now and focus on what's happening right now. Can I deal with what's happening in this moment or does it actually need my attention? I think there might be a couple comments. Okay, um, Shanae had made a note, slowing your breathing and taking note of what is around you. Absolutely. If you um, slow down your breathing and pay attention, right, that is being more mindful. I have one caveat about the slowing the breathing. Don't try to slow the breathing to try to get rid of your anxiety because it will backfire, right? When we slow our anxiety to try to, or slow our breathing to try to get rid of anxiety, then what we start doing is monitoring. How am I breathing? Am I breathing too fast? And then our fight or flight kicks in all over again and we start getting anxious again. Right. So slowing our breathing more is a way of I want to pay attention to my breath so that I can focus is a different thing. Okay, guys. So I'm going to move into the final portion of this, which is just talking about suicidal thinking and recognizing it and addressing it. We have till 11 to 15, right, guys? Yes. And we, frankly, we have as long as you need. Okay. <laughs> This will be just a few more minutes. Okay, so, um, so some things to know about suicide. Um, the suicide rate in the United States, and this, I'm just quoting United States um, statistics here. If you're interested at all in what's going on in the world, you can look at the World Health Organization. But in the United States, our suicide rate increased 33% from 1999 to 2019. It is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and it is the second leading cause of death for people in the group of ages 10 through 34. So this is an age group that is at high risk. 
that um, we would think that during the pandemic that the suicide rate was going to go up. That's what a lot of people were fearful was going to happen with the shutdown. Interestingly, that's not what happened. There actually has been a dip in the suicide rate since the pandemic. But we need to be cautious because as this becomes a long haul, as it continues on, and as we see how it plays out and impacts people's life, if jobs continue to be lost, uh, living situations, et cetera, right? Those are some things that could impact it. But for now, there hasn't been a rise. So a lot of people struggle um, with talking about suicide and addressing it. And, and I think it's something that it's important for us to be able to address and talk about because actually if we can, we can save a life. Um, so the more comfortable we are all with talking about it, whether it's ourself that's experiencing those feelings or whether it's about somebody that we love or care about, we can really be a part of making a difference. So what are some warning signs? Well, one warning sign is um, paying attention to how people talk. They may be talking about killing themselves, right? People who are considering suicide do, not always, but they do talk about killing themselves. Or they may talk more about feeling trapped, being a burden to people, or they feel hopeless. Behavioral things that you might see might be increased use of drug or alcohol, drugs or alcohol, um, isolative behavior and somebody who is, doesn't normally do that, um, being more withdrawn. You might find that they are, if you have access to their internet searches, they may be searching online about ways to end their life. Some people think that people searching online about that are just looking for attention, but, um, and, and that could be, but frankly, they may actually really be looking for real ways to do it. It is a common thing that people who do make an attempt or do end their lives do search it out online before they act. Um, giving away possessions or even saying goodbye to people. And in mood, you may notice depression, symptoms of anxiety, irritability, loss of interest in things that used to be of interest to the person, um, or a sudden improvement, okay? So if you've seen somebody who uh, appeared like they might be suicidal, but then you notice all of a sudden they seem fine, that actually can be a really high risk time for somebody, okay? Because what may happen is they may have come to a resolution and a plan and a good comfort with they're going to act and they feel lighter because they know their suffering's about to end, okay? So if you think someone is suicidal, it's really important to talk to them. Do it privately, not in front of a lot of other people and really listen. Okay. One of the things that happens with people who are suicidal is that when they share what they're going through, what most of us do is we start to feel incredible pain and discomfort when we hear their pain and discomfort. And then what we wanna do is we want to try to show them the bright side or convince them why they're wonderful or why life is worth living. And I can tell you what that does for people who are suicidal is it shuts them right down, okay? Because what they're, it's, it's like if I say to you right now, um, I'm really happy. And you say, no, you're not. What are you talking about? you're not happy, you're this, you're that. Look at what's going on in the world, right? You just um, canceled out what my experience is, okay? So the person who is suicidal and is communicating that they are, what they actually need from us is to hear that we hear them and we hear what their experience is because frequently they feel incredibly alone in it and a lot of people don't want to hear it. Right. And so we don't need to be afraid that because we are hearing them and listening to it, that they are going to act. Actually, that may be one of the things that helps to save them and prevent them from act, from acting. Um, so don't be afraid to ask them, hey, are you suicidal? Are you thinking about harming yourself? People aren't more likely to act because we ask that. 
they're actually less likely to act and to actually share what's going on. So if they are suicidal, we wanna take them seriously. We wanna help them to remove any lethal means like you can ask. So do you have a plan? What's around getting rid of the guns, getting rid of the drugs that they were planning to use, um, encouraging them to seek help if they're willing to. Um, there is a national suicide prevention lifeline. This is the phone number here. If you guys are gonna get it in a handout that I'm sending to you too, so you don't need to write this down. Um, but I wanna tell you something about this suicide prevention lifeline. It's not just for the person who's suicidal. If you love someone who is suicidal or have a friend who is, or even an acquaintance, you can call, they will talk to you. I've called them myself and talked with them. It's free, they're, they're, they're terrific, and they can really help you with resources. And then finally, if you're talking to somebody and you're hearing their darkness, it's really important for you to get support for yourself if you feel uneasy afterward or like you're struggling, right? Like sometimes after we hear these things, we have to download it to someone else. So this is why calling the, just the lifeline, you don't necessarily have to go talk to a therapist. You can call the lifeline yourself and talk, right? Or talk to a friend. I'm gonna take a peek. I see there are some questions. Ah, uh, yeah, Sarah said that some people, mm, Sarah said that as someone who feels suicidal, I can't comprehend what the bright side is. And when I'm in the thick of it, it makes no sense at all. Yeah. Um, some people just need to know they aren't alone and that someone cares. Yeah, I, it, it, Sarah, thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, sometimes when people start talking about the bright side, it can be like sitting in a dark room and someone walks in with the brightest of bright flashlights and shines it on you. And it's like, it's really important to be able to go into that darkness and hear what's going on. And being that, the, that September is Suicide Awareness Month, this is an important time to be talking about this. Okay, I'm going to stop my share and just open this up for anything anybody may. Shanae says the people on the other end of those call centers are beautiful. They are. They are. I, I have cried to them more than once, um, and they're beautifully understanding. So guys, I want to open it up. If you want to put any questions in the chat, anything that I didn't cover, anything you want to know more about. Colleen says, what do you think about tapping to help manage anxiety instead of slow breathing? Um, so I, I don't know any research that actually supports the tapping. Um, so I'm not a good person to ask about it. I, um, the, the, the methods I usually use to, um, to deal with anxiety are more about understanding that anxiety is not dangerous and practicing actually being anxious in small doses. The more that we can practice being anxious in small doses, the more we actually adapt and adjust. Um, I, I have heard some people talk about the tapping, but unfortunately I'm, I'm not able to comment on it. Any other questions, guys? Are there any treatment centers for teens that you know of that take Medi-Cal? I know lots of families and teens that need help that can't afford. Um, so if you, if you check your local department of mental health, I'm not sure if everybody is from Santa Clarita. Um, in Santa Clarita, we have the Child and Family Center, which does take Medi-Cal. Um, and then if you're not in Santa Clarita, there is usually a center wherever you're located. So your local department of mental health will usually know who those Medi-Cal providers are. You're welcome. How important do I think that therapy is? Well, I'm a psychologist, so. <laughs> Um, you know, I, 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 I think that, um, I think therapy is important when you've hit a point where the resources around you are not um, helping you to get to what it is that you need to get to, 
Okay. So if, if what's going on is impacting your ability to function at your job, in your social relationships, um, with school or whatever is important to you, um, that's when we can say your functioning is impaired. And if your functioning is impaired, that's when it's a good thing to be seeking extra help. Sometimes that can be through a self-help workbook. Sometimes that can be through support groups. Sometimes that can be talking to a friend. But when those things don't seem to be touching upon it, I absolutely think therapy can be a really, really important thing. And for some people, it's the first line. A lot of people don't want to go to a support group or a self-help group. They want to go and talk to a person. So I think it can be incredibly helpful. But what I will say is what's important is finding a therapist that you actually connect with very well. That relationship is a big part of it. All right, I am going to turn it back over to Nicole and Phyllis and the gang. Thank you guys so much for having me today. I wanted to know um, that we will post the two uh, resources you mentioned, uh, Michelle, on our website. So they will be there and will be available um, to anyone as well. Phyllis? Yes, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to say thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing ways to manage our anxiety and self-care. What a great workshop you've given us. We have a lot to think about now. And as um, Nicole mentioned, I will email because I'll, I'll be able to have a copy of everyone in attendance. I'll have your email. So I will be sending you the copies of the two documents that are talked about just as soon as I can. Um, in moving forward, I'd like to ask you to mark your calendars because our next Life Forward workshop is scheduled for Saturday, October the 9th from 10 to 11.15. The title is Communications and Relationship Skills, Be More Effective with Family in the Workplace and Community. And of course, over Zoom, but that seems to be our life these days. It will be presented by Wendy Amara. She is a transformational strategy life and business coach. You won't want to miss this important workshop about communication and relationship interactions because they're such personal, important per people skills. Once again, thank you for joining us today and be sure to check our website later as we will be posting the recording of this workshop along with the documents and uh, you will find other previous workshops also available on our website for viewing. So thank you for attending and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.